I was saying, I'm quite literally, I have nothing to add. Uh, not figuratively, actually, literally, uh, nothing to add except uh, gratitude, uh, appreciation for all of those remarkable leaders, Senator Portentino, uh, in particular, Attorney General Rob Bonta, who drove this effort last year uh, and will be driving it as we initiate the new legislative uh, session this year. To all of those uh, that hold perhaps an even more extraordinary title, and that is uh, leaders with moral authority, those with moms that demand action, and Brady and Giffords, none of this is possible without you. None of California's progress in gun safety uh, has been possible uh, without your extraordinary leadership and your capacity to distill the essence of what uh, this is all about. And uh, I will assure you, having spent uh, the latter part of the last, uh, well, 10 or so days visiting with victims of violence, two mass shootings, one in Half Moon Bay and, of course, uh, Monterey Park. Uh, this is brought uh, into uh, form and substance that only furthers my resolve to continue uh, California's rightful position as a leader in the gun safety movement. It has been said, uh, but let me punctuate uh, the point that was asserted and reinforce it. Uh, the national conversation in gun safety has been led by the state of California. Going back to, you can argue, year of my birth, 1967, May, uh, where we began the process of advancing common sense gun safety reforms. 1989, the assault weapons ban leadership that emanated out of the state of California in 1994 with the national assault weapons ban by our own Senator Dianne Feinstein after the tragedies of the 101 California shooting. We continued to recognize with humility that we can do more and better and was punctuated as well that uh, we did just that last year with the ghost guns legislation and extending uh, liability to uh, manufacturers of these weapons, particularly weapons of mass destruction. We uh, continued that leadership uh, with remarkable leaders behind me, uh, that led an effort around marketing to children and just the, just the outrage as a parent of seeing blue pacifiers and pink pacifiers used in ads to promote JR-15s so that young children, babies, can learn the muscle memory that is required when they're old enough or perhaps unfortunate enough to be in the possession of a weapon of mass destruction, uh, an AR-15 type platform. Uh, it's remarkable we're living at this moment in time. It's also remarkable, it's a point of contrast, that we're living in a moment in time where you have states like Florida that are moving in the exact opposite direction. It was stated earlier this week, the governor of Florida wants to move without any permits or any consideration, no requirements whatsoever, none for training. Why should you be trained? Despite all the evidence, not even evidence, it's not even, there's no controversy here. Everything that was stated was factual. I think the only distinction is at 36 or 37% lower than the national average, the gun death rate in the state of California. Is it 58% or 59% lower gun death rate for children? Are we the seventh lowest or the 44th highest in terms of safety related to gun safety? Those are the only distinctions in the data. Gun safety saves lives. More guns, more lives lost. The data is overwhelming. You saw in the dissent of this New York decision that reinforced by the justices that pointed out uh, more handguns, more suicides. More handguns, more suicides. Three times more likely men to die of suicides in the possession of a handgun. Seven times, if you're a woman, more likely to die of suicide with handguns. This will lead to more handgun possession, more suicides. This will lead to more officer-involved shootings, no officers being killed in the line of duty. Three times higher rate of incidents on the basis of the number of guns in their states. These are the facts. They're not only in evidence, they're well understood by those that are open argument interested in evidence. It's not understood by the ideologues, and that's what we're up against. The history only ideologues that go back to, well, their selected history of what the world looked like in 1790, when there were what? 300? Four million people living in America. Hmm. Biggest city in America, New York, I think had maybe 32, 33,000 people. Predominantly rural farmers. This history-only approach, you're seeing it over and over again. I look forward to Judge Benitez's decision. It's already written. 
where he's likely to overturn our assault weapons ban. Stay tuned. That's a preview of things to come in the next few weeks. Large capacity magazine clips. That will likely be thrown out by these same ideologues. We saw Judge Nelson, great Trump appointee, who talked about revolutionary armies, and how young men were the ones that stood between freedom and tyranny, presumably um, somehow equating those that are doing the same with you know, AR-15s or other assault weapons to those with muskets. I mean, it's perverse. The whole thing is perverse. And the selectivity of the history-only approach is well understood by those that, well, are willing to understand history. Read the dissent on this decision for a master class in understanding the absurdity of the decision that forces us to the position we're in today, where we have to remove the word may and insert the word shall. Shall provide this right, as they assert, but with conditions and caveats that I think are quite thoughtful and learned based upon reality, lived reality, based upon public safety and the need and desire to keep you safe, keep our law enforcement officers safe, to keep people that are struggling safe. And so that's what brings us all here, is that spirit, um, and I couldn't be more proud of the remarkable leaders that are assembled here today once again. There is an elephant in the room. We fell short last year. No one's naive about that. There was one disappointing thing about a remarkable legislative year. Uh, it was that we fell a little short. That's not going to happen this year. No question about that. Um, and, uh, and that's because you haven't given up and you're not going to give in to that cynicism. So we're here with absolute confidence and expectation. You can write that one. Write that check. Take that, what's the old phrase, to the bank. Back to the bank. I will be signing this legislation. I don't think that. I know that. So you can ask me how. I just do. It's just going to happen um, because of the folks behind me and because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so we're at that moment um, where uh, we need to also be mindful, and this final words, and we'll open up to many questions I imagine you have on this subject. Um, but mindful, as was stated, that despite the efficacy of our gun safety laws that have been nation leading, no other state doing more, not just to lead the national conversation, but to advance common sense gun safety, that the last few weeks just remind us that this is, you know, we're not an island on our own, that we need the federal government to participate and advance similar, as Rob was saying, common sense. But it's hard. I, I was there at Monterey Park thinking, is this a two- or three-day national story? And the next day I was in Half Moon Bay saying, is this a one-day story? Well, why don't you check your national feeds? 50 plus mass shootings was stated so far this year. 50, I don't know how many days in January, 30, 31? 50 so far. 50 plus, 1,500 people just gunned down and it's just become so normalized. We're just not going to allow that. We're going to continue to do more and do better with humility. We're going to continue to assess what did or did not occur as it relates to those mass shootings that have been well chronicled, understand what we can do to complement the work, because it's solving for a pattern. We're trying to solve for a pattern. And we're not going to lay, we're going to fall prey to the predictable response to every shooting. Well, this law in this case wouldn't have solved this issue. There's a pattern. And California's been solving for a pattern, and it's working. We're saving lives. But we have more work to do, and this is part of this effort, and I couldn't be, again, more proud to be with all of you at this time, and I cannot uh, impress upon you more how much I look forward to signing this bill as soon as it gets to my desk. With that, we're here to answer any questions you Governor, guys may have. There's a list of places that um, concealed weapons would be banned very long yeah. in the bill. There, there is a notable exception that says that if business owners or churches put up a sign 
that says guns are okay, then that's allowed. So I'm wondering why that was included and do you support that? Well, let's talk to our author who's more eager than anyone to answer that question. <laughs> you know, you've heard a number of us today. First of all, I want to say thank you to the governor and thank you to the attorney general for sponsoring this legislation because it's going to get through in a robust form because of their expertise and their passion. So I just want to make sure we're clear about that. You've heard many of us use the word reasonable, common sense, prudent. We want this to be constitutional at the end of the day. Uh, this is not window dressing. This is to put a strong bill on the governor's desk that's going to withstand the legal challenge that's sure to come. And by having that provision, you can't argue that it's a total prohibition. You can't argue that it's somehow so prescriptive that people can't have some sovereignty over the issue. And I think that's a, a legal nuance that I think helps it with constitutional muster. And I don't know if the AG wants to comment on that from his perspective as well. But that's yeah. Well, let me just say that the, the sensitive site component of the bill is super important. Again, um, uh, following the blueprint of, of Bruin, uh, there are quite a, a number of reasons or whys behind the, the sensitive sites, including protecting children in places like parks and schools and, and uh, playgrounds, making sure that we don't have guns in places where um, where alcohol is served and also making sure that there aren't guns to intimidate uh, others from exercising their their rights, like the right to vote in polling stations or um, uh, the, the right to free assembly or uh, the legislative process in government buildings. So a lot of important reasons behind the sensitive sites. I don't want you to just see it as a list. There's a why behind every one it's been thought of. Um, and when it comes to some of the um, private um, property locations, of course we have private uh, property uh, ownership rights. Uh, the default is uh, concealed carry weapons are not allowed. If you affirmatively state that you, on your own property, uh, want to allow them, then the bill allows for that. Um, you also know that there's a um, component in the New York law that's very similar, that's being um, appealed right now. We have an amicus uh, brief that we filed from the California Department of Justice that, uh, in support of that position, uh, we think that strikes the right balance between uh, property ownership rights and, and gun safety. Uh, in a broader regime that will keep people safe. Is there anything else specific that you changed, either uh, Senator or AG, to address this question of constitutionality and sort of try to head off legal challenges from last year's bill? The, the changes in the bill um, are not significantly substantive from last year. I mean, the, the AG's office did, a, a very, in my opinion, a good job of sort of using the Bruin decision and the, the opinions of the justices to craft what we have. So there's an exemption for uh, sheriff's uh, department employees that's a prudent exemption. That's different from last year. There's a, a, a change in uh, if you're at a school site, making sure that you have to lock your weapon in your car. You can't take that lockbox into the school site. That's another one of the changes from last year. So they're not, the, and then raising the purchase age, making clear it's consistent with other California law that you have to be 21 to purchase a gun. Those are the three big changes from last year. But the, the roadmap that Bruin provided is what the Attorney General's office and alleged counsel have used to craft what we're at today. Can I ask about the 21 age? Because last year a federal appeals court overturned one of the laws that California has already passed trying to raise the age for selling semi-automatic weapons to 21. So that seems to you know, raise questions about whether the 21 age also puts this bill into legal jeopardy. What is the reason for setting that age at 21? Instead of I can't say we're not looking at that case because we are, but we do feel that the, the way it's crafted in SB2, it will withstand constitutional muster. And again, m we do have the, gun, the general gun purchase age in California to 21, and that still is the law of California. So it's consistent with California law, and we think it's going to withstand constitutional muster. Senator, why no urgency clause on this bill? There was one on SB918 last year. What's, what's changed? So two reasons. We can always put it in as it goes through the process. So that door is not closed. The second piece is we want to make sure that we do the right thing in how we craft it. And again, as other states and other courts make decisions, we're going to be monitoring that as it goes through the legislative process. And so we want the nimble, uh, the ability to be nimble to make sure that whatever we send to Governor Newsom is the strongest bill possible, but also the most constitutionally sound bill. So we're not going to rush that. We owe it to the, Cali to the people of California to be as prudent and judicious through the process. If we get to the point where we're pleased with the final product and 
there's still time to make it an urgency. That's a conversation that the governor, uh, the attorney general, and I will have to see if we want to put it in. But we have time to do that. But let's start by just focusing on the policy and getting it through the through the process. Attorney General Bonta, you were on the floor of the assembly when this bill kept striking out late at night, and I'm wondering what the conversations were among members. What were the concerns with this piece <coughs> of legislation for those who were not willing to get it through? Let me answer that question in one second. I want to answer, uh, add to Ms. Lagos' er er earlier um, question about the constitutional compliance of the bill. We, we believe last year's bill was constitutionally compliant. We believe this bill is constitutionally compliant. We followed the guidance of Bruin. Uh, we immediately said there will be no good cause or proper cause component. That part was struck down by the Bruin decision. We understand that. We immediately said that is no longer enforceable. That's severed from uh, the California law. And there was also um, guidance that we need to have more objective standards that are not gray and subjective. We try to be clear, certain, specific, objective with the standards that are set forth. Uh, one other change in addition to the uh, ones that Senator Portantino um, pointed out is uh, the prior version of the bill uh, had requirements to become qualified to get a CCW. This approach um, in, in SB2 assumes you're qualified unless you're disqualified. And so it's a, a little bit semantics, but it's, it's a real substantive change, um, and, and that's in the bill as well. Uh, last year, at the end of session, uh, we had the votes until we didn't have the votes. Uh, that's how it is at the end of session. Having been at the end of session uh, nine times in my uh, legislative career, um, uh, there are folks who on another day and another time would have voted for the bill, just not that day and that night. And so uh, they're going to have to live with the decisions that they make, and the impact that it has on California, um, but we're confident. Uh, uh, we're not looking backward, we're looking forward. We're confident <coughs> we'll get the votes this year, and we'll make communities safer throughout California. Governor, are you more confident that it will pass this year because of a lot of the new progressive members that joined the legislature? No, just uh, uh, the, what the Attorney General just said is spot on. I mean, this, we have the votes. It's, I mean, we, and more than that was for the urgency clause, which is a much higher threshold. Just the majority will get this done. It's a 90-day distinction between whether or not we do an urgency or whether it lands. So I'd like to see it as soon as possible. But that's the art of what's possible. It's, these are the experts. They'll, they'll guide that with the leadership of the Assembly and the Senate. Um, and uh, I'm not fixated on that. The progress we made last year on gun safety, again, second to none. California led last year um, in this is an opportunity to take a look at the landscape. In some ways, this is, um, uh, gives us, as the Attorney General said, uh, the ability to, to make some tweaks uh, in real time, and as the author said, to continue uh, to be iterative based upon court rulings that we're seeing across the country and other efforts, similar efforts across the nation. So uh, I think we're in a very good place, and uh, I don't think the makeup of legislature dramatically changes things, though I am more optimistic uh, still uh, with the makeup because uh, a lot of the new members, uh, many I'll be seeing tonight at a reception, uh, have expressed uh, passionate desire to be participatory in more gun safety initiatives. Governor, the issue has um, been increasingly raised as a public health crisis, uh, the flood of guns on the streets. And I wonder, especially as someone who has done so much in the area of social determinants and, and, and root causes, what, if anything, you think the public health system and, and perhaps the health care system has to answer for this crisis, as we're seeing an unfolding crisis. I don't know if they answered much. I mean, some of the most forceful leaders uh, have been emergency room physicians uh, in, in organizations representing them uh, because they see this carnage firsthand, as I did last week. I was in, in, in two different hospitals, met four victims, one in the ICU, um, uh, one whose leg was shattered and a rod was uh, placed. It uh, wasn't lost on me. The first thing he had to ask of me was uh, was a question that uh, he should have asked his doctor, and said, when do I get out of here? And I said, well, let me bring the doctor in. He says, no, 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 no. When do I get out of here for a different reason? He says, because I don't have insurance, and I can't pay. And I said, you don't have to worry about that. Legislature appropriated money last year, dollars, 8.7 million specifically, we identified just in the victim services that was added last year for the DA's office in L.A. County alone, and that's in addition to everything else we're doing. Uh, but the idea that it, one has that mindset only reinforces uh, just the absurdity of this American-made reality. This is American-made. Governor, critics are going to 
going to say concealed weapon permits are given to people who are law abiding. Um, I know experts have called for a tighter licensing scheme statewide, maybe more public station of teams, gun violence restraining order. Are those things you're going to focus on? Is there anything beyond this you want to talk about? Well, we, we, we weren't. Uh, we had rules and regulations prior to this New York decision that have their historical footings, as was suggested, in 1911. They've been tested. We had protocols in place along the lines of what, uh, how you framed that question. Um, they disrupted that. And they forced a different consciousness. Now it's not good moral character. Uh, now we don't have the capacity to uh, adjudicate certain uh, points. Uh, that we prior uh, had prior, and, and now we have a, a provision may to shell, and uh, that forces our hand on the other side uh, around sensitive places. I find it the height of irony these same judges that are pontificating uh, around these historical uh, traditions are the same ones that have no problem limiting those same weapons from their courtrooms. <laughs> yeah. Governor Newsom, we've heard today that California often leads the nation when it comes to legislation like this. At the federal level, you have a new party in control of Congress and new Speaker of the House who's well, you heard from the speaker his, 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 his deep concern and passion expressed around the two shootings in his home state. I mean, you, 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 that was expressed immediately after the Monterey Park and, uh, and uh, Half Moon Bay. If I appear to be facetious. Um, have you had any conversations with him about this? I have near expectation that he has the capacity of leadership in this space. He's never demonstrated it. He wants to roll back all these rules and regulations. Of course, he represents the murder capital of California. What can you do, as you say, to make the federal government participate in this space? We could continue through the power of emulation. Success leaves clues. We're not a small, isolated state. We're the fourth largest economy on planet Earth. We're the tenth pole of the American economy. There's no more essential state than the state of California. We've led in a bipartisan way going back to 1967. Success leaves clues. As the Attorney General himself said, wisely, appropriately, um, and emphatically, we have the playbook. But we need participants. You saw in the Gilroy shooting, the shooter was able to go to a neighboring state without the rules and regulations. So this is a national disgrace. It's a national epidemic. It's American-made. We've chosen this reality. We've chosen this reality. It's happened on our collective watch. And they're choosing this for their kids and their grandkids. They're choosing to put law enforcement in more harm's way. They're choosing to put victims, young, innocent people in harm's way. They choose that as they sell fear around crime. They sell calm around these perverse, perverse gun laws that they promote or provisions of the Constitution that they, with respect, I think, pervert. Mr. Senator, Governor, uh, uh, Mr. 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 Governor, for the folks down in the Central Valley, uh, the, the, the Selma police officer was just shot and killed. Uh, I know you released a statement on that today. I know the district attorney in Fresno County was uh, released a statement which did not appear to be very pleased. Or she, she blamed, uh, I believe, AB 109, and it's commonly called as a prison. Why does she blame herself? She should blame herself. I've been listening to this for years from her. She has the prosecutorial discretion. Ask her what she did in terms of prosecuting that case. I'm sick and tired of being lectured by her on public safety. Sick and tired. So with all due respect to her statement, she should be ashamed of herself and she look in the mirror. And, and follow up uh, from the Tulare County Sheriff, I, I know that after the Goshen uh, mass shooting a few weeks ago, uh, he is asking you to uh, look into the death penalty for us as gun violence assailants who target uh, babies or infants. Do you believe that uh, is a good or bad idea? I think we should find the perpetrators. I think we need to close that case.
Senator Portantino last year and Attorney General Bonta were in the back of the chamber. This is a question for you, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how involved in the process are you going to be this year to making sure it gets across the finish line? And then uh, the recent unfortunate mass shootings have been mentioned many times, but how much evidence is there that this is a CCW problem? Um, and can you respond to criticism uh, from Republicans and Second Amendment groups that California should instead be looking at the criminal? Uh, I appreciate it. It's, it's what I was alluding to a moment ago. It's, it's just it's, it's just tried and true. It's routine. Every time there's a mass shooting, this won't particular this particular law, this particular reaction won't solve for that. But you can solve for a pattern. California's proven that over the course of decades. We have solved for a pattern more than most other states. Demonstrably true. Thirty seven percent reduction or rather lower gun death rate than other states. Sixty seven percent, I think, in the twenty twenty data, than Texas. Last place I want to be is Texas. And these judges, Benitez and Nelson, who was on that twenty one age, want to turn us into Texas. We're gonna fight back against that and those instincts. And those Republican talking points over and over and over again, Pablo, complete Pablo. But is there evidence that the recent state of mass shootings is a problem with the CCW process in California? We're analyzing those particular instances, but none of us, not one of us, came up here today on this topic asserting that this was in response to. This was a bill that was part of our legislative package last year. We've made some modest tweaks that we think are consistent uh, with the we think a very bad ruling, the United States Supreme Court last year, uh, and we are moving forward this year uh, with conviction, uh, and I'm moving forward with certainty uh, that it will land on my desk because of the resolve uh, and the character and quality of leadership assembled today. And will you today. those calls to lawmakers that might be on the fence, that might have questions, oh, that I, uh, might be involved in the this, uh, That's... Uh, We'll get this on my desk, and I'm looking forward to getting it very shortly. Let me, let me, hold on a second. Let me answer uh, evidence of the governor's presence today. Uh, it, it shows this is a priority to, to this governor and to this state. And let me just sort of juxtapose that with some other governors. We have a governor in Florida who is going after uh, Black History Month <laughs> as a priority. We have a governor in Tennessee who's going after pronouns as a priority. Um, this governor is going after sensible gun safety for the people of California. That in and of itself is laudable and makes a difference. And the fact that we're here talking about a legislative amendment with the Attorney General and the Governor and a slew of legislative leaders shows that this is important. And as far as the effectiveness, it's all of these gun legislations that work in concert with each other, in, that complement each other. We know the statistics work. There are way too many guns in too many hands, and that is a prescription for disaster. Can you know on Tuesday if your law prevented something on Tuesday or Thursday or on Friday? You don't know what specific day, but you know in the aggregate it makes California safer. And to have a governor who recognizes that behind the, diet, the data and the science and says, you know what, everything we know points to the needle going in this progressive direction, makes a difference and I'm going to go out there and lead, we should be proud of that. Mm -hmm. And we know it makes a difference. Governor, Governor Newsom, we're going to with technicians. You speak about solving for a pattern, and there is a pattern with domestic violence and mass shootings, yep. depending on what research group you look at, anywhere That's 50 right. to 70 percent. Domestic violence is not considered a violent felony in California, so I'm wondering where you stand on the push, I know, from Republicans to try and change that. Well, as it relates to the issue of guns and the relationship uh, to these shootings. I'm very proud of California's leadership on the restraining orders. I'm very proud of California's leadership on relinquishment, the voters of the state of California, and in an initiative, Prop 63, advanced relinquishment at adjudication uh, to address the backlog, particularly um, uh, for uh, people not just in domestic violence incidents, but across the spectrum. We expanded it beyond that scope. Uh, the Violent restraining order was supplemented last year with money uh, to promote the program. I think it was 11 plus million, my recollection, uh, to encourage its utilization. And we've seen that. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of people. Uh, you're referring, I believe, to an initiative that was approved by the voters, Proposition 57, 
uh, and uh, provisions that in the past have been loosely defined. I'd have to get more specifics about what any new proposals there are before I comment specifically on that. So that was the, that was the last question. I just want to say that a number of our, my colleagues out here have other gun legislation that they're going to be introducing this year. Stay tuned. This is a team effort that's going to work uh, together to make California safer. And thank you all for being out today. And uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Attorney General, and thank you to the activists. You know, we owe it to the activists and the survivors to do everything we can. So thank you all for being out today. Governor, one more question. That was good.